Welcome back to the class Computational Neuroscience, Neuronal Dynamics of Cognition. This week we talk about synaptic plasticity and learning. And now it's time to talk about models of long-term potentiation and long-term depression. Let's go back to happy and learning. If you look at the statement, there are two things that are important. The first one is, HEP refers to a local procedure. So, for the change of this connection point here, WIJ, what matters is just the activity of the sending neuron and the activity of the receiving neuron. And the other aspect is this, when an axon of cell J repeatedly or persistently takes part in firing cell I. And this means that somehow the two cells, J and I, have to be active together. Now, to formulate this mathematically, we will work with a rate model. And rate model means we just talk about a fine rate, which is number of spikes, the rate nu, number of spikes divided by some time window t, which is this interval here. So let's formulate rate models of happy and learning. So first we want to exploit that it's a local rule. Local rule means for the change of this connection, I can only use information that's available. Well, what's available is the spikes that would travel along the axon to the synapse. And since we are talking about a rate model, this will be covered by the presynaptic firing rate. Similarly, if the postsynaptic neuron is active, it can be characterized by its postsynaptic firing rate, spikes per second. So this would be a completely local rule. However, there's a more general local rule. These are not the only quantities that are locally available. What's also available is the weight of the synapse itself. The synapse, WIJ, knows about its own weight. And therefore, this is part of our local rule. When we talked about reward-based learning, we also considered the possibility that a neuromodulator could influence the synapse. And so this information would also be locally available at the site of the synapse. So this is a fairly general local rule for rate-based happy and learning. Now, I'm a theoretician. I can look at experiments and I realize I don't know this function f. So what I do as a theoretician in this case is I say, well, it's certainly a smooth function. So let's do a Taylor expansion of this function f. A normal state would be a neuron that does not emit spikes. So we will do the Taylor expansion in the rates around zero rate. And so if none of the neurons fires, neither the presynaptic one nor the postsynaptic one, then there is a contribution A0. This is the zero order expansion coefficient. So in the absence of any activity, in the absence of any spikes, the weight may change. But then if there are spikes, of the presynaptic neurons, then these spikes alone can cause a change, and the expansion coefficients is this A1 of 3. The postsynaptic spikes alone could do some change to the synapse, and this is the coefficient A1 post that picks up this. And then, of course, there could be joint activity, pre and post together, and that would be picked up by this coefficient here. So, a happen rule is a local rule, but it will be sensitive to the joint activity of pre- and post-synaptic neurons. And therefore, this is the first Hepian term that, ter that shows up in, in this expansion. But of course, we will have more terms in the expansion. For example, there will be a term which is just post-synaptic activity, but the post-synaptic firing rate squared. Or there could be a term which is new i post squared but presynaptic activity. So this lower index 2 indicates I have twice the rate. Here it's three times post. Here also it's twice the rate, it's post squared. Here it's post squared times 3. So it's an A3 and it's a coefficient that's sensitive again to the correlations. So in that sense, this would also be a term that picks up 
correlations between pre- and postsynaptic neurons. Now, I made the expansion with respect to the rates. That means the expansion coefficients will still depend on the weight itself. They would also depend on the presence or absence of neuromodulators. And this is true for each one of these coefficients. They will depend on the other parameters, in particular the synaptic weight. Same thing here, same thing there. Now this weight dependence is very useful for modeling because it allows you to limit the total size of the weights. I mentioned earlier that the size of the weight somehow is linked to the size of the spine on the postsynaptic neuron, the postsynaptic side of the synapse. Now you can imagine that such a synapse cannot become infinitely big. Obviously, it cannot become larger than the total brain altogether. So we need to limit this. And one way to limit this is to say, well, there's a maximum weight and each one of these coefficients, or at least some of them, will stop and go to zero if the weight has reached the maximum weight. But we can also do this in a smooth fashion, like this. And we can also limit it on this side and make it and impose a dependence in such a form. So the weight dependence of the coefficients is important. I will not, however, note this down each and every time. So now let's look at some of the terms in our expansion. One of the terms that I have highlighted as a Hepian term because it's sensitive to correlations is this term here. Let's suppose from the moment that this is the only term. The weight change depends on pre- and post-synaptic activity together with a positive coefficient here. Say, pre-synaptic activity, large firing, means 20 hertz. Then the pre-synaptic neuron is on. The post-synaptic neuron fires at 15 or 20 hertz or 25 hertz, it's also on. So if I multiply 20 times 20, I get a big number. So I get a positive change. Now, if one of the neurons is off, if one of the neurons does not fire, then there is no weight change. So, this rule picks up the fact that joint activity of pre- and post-synaptic neurons will lead to a positive weight change, as mentioned in the HEP rule. However, there's a problem. Suppose we form a HEPian assembly with this learning rule. So, there have been neurons that are active together, and they have formed these strong links. But the same network will later have to store a second concept, for example, a banana. So other neurons will be active together and will again lead to strengthening of connections. So you can imagine that the network will rapidly fill up with strong connections. And in the end, it will not be functional at all. So what we need to do is to limit this. A learning rule which can only do positive changes, which means increase the weights, cannot work. We need something to put also in some minus signs. And here's one possibility. Just subtract a constant. So this would correspond to our A0 term, which we have picked smaller than 0. Then we keep the positive part, if this constant is small enough. But there, where there has been a 0 before is now a minus sign. Look at the next rule. This one is interesting. It says, I need presynaptic activity to get a change. But then it depends on a postsynaptic activity. Say, postsynaptic neuron on means 20 hertz, and this threshold is 10 hertz. Then I get a positive change if the postsynaptic neuron is on. But I get a negative change if the presynaptic neuron is active and the postsynaptic neuron is off. Here's another one of these rules. It will work nicely again here, but we use it twice. So in this case, on and on gives a positive change, but off and off will also give a positive change. Now, all of these rules are Hepian rules. Hep's statement was somewhat intuitive and somewhat unprecise. He was a theoretical psychologist. He formulated in words. He said if the precinct of the neuron participates in firing the postsynaptic one. So if both are active together, there's a positive change. But he didn't talk about all the other possibilities. But we as theoreticians, we have to put this in math. 
And once you put it in math, you see there's not just one Hebbian rule. There are many different instantiations of Hebbian rules. So let's look at this rule again. This was the third in the list. We need pre-synaptic activity. So now we assume that pre-synaptic activity is positive. And then it depends on the postsynaptic neuron. If its activity is above the threshold, I get a positive change. If it's below the threshold, I get a negative change. Now we can generalize this and say, I have some function here, function of the postsynaptic neuron. I still need presynaptic activity for a change. But if there's a presynaptic activity, then it depends on the state of the postsynaptic neuron. And if it's above theta, I get a positive change. If it's below theta, I get a negative change. And the only new thing is now it's a smooth function and it goes to zero if the postsynaptic neuron is inactive. So this looks quite general. And yet, this is still part of the expansion that I had on one of the preceding slides. So let's just X this out. I have a B times new I post squared times new J pre. And then I have a minus theta B new I post new J pre. Now this is one of these correlation detecting terms which comes here with a positive sign. This is another of these correlation detecting terms and it comes here with a negative sign. So this is also a valid Hepian learning rule. So this rule is in fact called the BCM rule for Beanstock, Cooper and Munro who published this rule in 1982. And what they realized is that this rule works nicely, however, this threshold theta that appears in the formulation cannot be constant. The threshold theta itself has to somehow reflect the average postsynaptic activity, now averaged over a slightly longer time scale. And so this is the first example of a homeostatic mechanism. The possibility to make this threshold theta change depending on the mean activity allows to generate more LTD, more negative weight changes, if the threshold is high, which reflects that the neuron is already firing over a long time at a high rate. The idea is that this increased region of LTD helps to weaken the synapses so that the firing rate of the postsynaptic neuron does not increase further. So, what are these Hepian learning rules good for? Well, Hepian learning detects correlations in the input. Suppose I have here a postsynaptic neuron, and this postsynaptic neuron gets input on, from three presynaptic neurons, and the input is sort of boring. It's always coming at three hertz. Uh, spikes look not very interesting. But at the other three input neurons, something interesting happens. There are periods where all neurons here fire at a very high rate, and then there are other periods where all these neurons are inactive or, or have a very low activity. So these three neurons go up and down together in their activity. In other words, these three neurons show correlations. So suppose that at the beginning of the development, neurons in the brain, for example in visual cortex, they are unselective. They have some, some strong weights from presynaptic neurons and some weak weights, and there is no specificity whatsoever. But now, if visual input comes in, visual, visual input will consist of objects that have a finite extension. So these neurons will go on together while these are silent, and these neurons will be active together while the other one is silent. And now what happens is that some synapses grow while others decay. There's competition. If some synapses grow, it's at the expense of others. And this competitive mechanism, driven by correlations in the input, leads to a specialization. So now, this neuron here gets very strong connections from these three neurons, while the other neuron gets very strong connections from the other three neurons. So, the output neurons specialize to develop localized receptive fields, 
And this is well known in the neurosciences that the development of receptive fields reflects the statistical structure of the input, the statistical structure of the outside world. And there have been many models over the decades that discussed the development of receptive fields, the self-organization of cortex. So this is really a tradition in computational neuroscience and a good unsupervised happy and learning rule should be able to account for this development of cortex. So what we have seen is that there are many different happy and learning rules. There's not just one rule, there's a family of happy and learning rules. And good happy and learning rules have to account for an increase of weights, long-term potentiation, and for a decrease of weights, long-term depression. If the learning rule is well balanced, it leads to a competition. Some synapses grow at the expense of other synapses, so that in the end, the neuron becomes specialized. And that means it can, for example, develop localized receptive fields. So before you go on with the videos, please take some time and look at this quiz. The idea is exactly the kind of paradigm I discussed. There's one receiving neuron, which gets input from two different groups, the red group and the blue group. And if the red group is active, the blue group is inactive. If the blue group is active, the red group is inactive. And they fire at different rates. And so the question is, what happens? Do we see a development of receptive field?